Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Earth Day Afternoon. My name is Katie Rodarte, and today we have two very exciting presentations lined up for you. Before we jump into those presentations, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. You may have noticed that the attendees list is disabled for today, and that is due to safety and security. We will also be enabling the chat box. However, we will have a Q&A section at the end. So if you have any questions throughout our presentations, please put your question in that Q&A box and we will do our best to answer those at the end of each presentation. For our first speaker, this individual was the 11th director at Los Alamos National Laboratory and served until the end of 2018. He is an internationally recognized expert in mineralogy and even has a mineral named after him. One of his favorite topics is the geology of northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. Without further ado, I pre present to you Director Emeritus, Dr. Terry Wallace. Good afternoon, and it's great here to be on Earth Day, and I remind you that 51 years ago, um, on April 22nd, 1970, our nation celebrated the very first Earth Day. It was both a celebration of our environment and was also a rallying call for putting the environmental concerns front and center for our country. I think it's difficult for most of us to uh, imagine what our country was like on that first Earth Day. You know, the um, gasoline for automobiles contained a special lead-based uh, ingredient that kept engines from knocking, but the exhaust from those quiet automobiles had raised what is called the uh, blood level, le lead level, or the BLL, by factors of more than 400 above what Americans had experienced in the previous century. Uh, there were no national standards for air quality. In fact, it was said that the pungent smell of ozone was a measure of human progress. Uh, there was little regulation of uh, things like uh, synthetic insecticides, and DDT is certainly the most famous of these. And there was absolutely no understanding of the aggregate consequences of human activities on the planet. There was no Environmental Protection Agency. There was no Clean Air Act. There was no Clean Water Act. Earth Day helped launch one of the biggest changes in American history. It was an environmental movement that helped human, put human health at the forefront. But it also sparked uh, human awareness of what our ecosystem is. And so what I'd like to do today uh, is take you on a journey of a part or a tiny sliver of this ecosystem. We're going to do a whirlwind tour of uh, geology for our backyard, namely northern Arizona. Now this land in many ways is very, very unique. It's at the crossroads of the American, North American continent. Uh, it's, that gives us a very diverse and complex landscape. We sit at the intersection of uh, three major geologic provinces, the Great Plains to the east, uh, the Rocky Mountains, which run down the spine in the middle of New Mexico, and of course the Colorado Plateau. And one of my uh, favorite quotes about our land is that uh, when people ask me where my roots are, I look down at my feet and I see the roots of my soul grasping at the earth. They are here in New Mexico. And in fact, uh, we're very much part of that environment. So I'd like to just take you to kind of a picture of what, how that environment was built and then maybe also how it influences on what our culture is and how we behave. This is uh, looking down on northern New Mexico, sort of like the map that you just saw in that previous slide, except from space about 1,000 kilometers up. And what we see in this thing uh, doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at it. Uh, but if you look at a couple things, uh, when we look here, you can see a few rivers. This is the Rio Grande River. And this is perhaps the most important landmark in the entire part of New Mexico. Uh, it's a, just a little ribbon. It's hardly a river, um, but it's greatly influenced our culture for over 2,000 years. You see some green there. Usually those are high latitude areas in which we have forest. And then off to the left of the figure here, of course, we see what looks like a gray or tan region. And this is uh, the San Juan Basin up towards Farmington. It happens to be one of the world's uh, largest oil fields, uh, and it basically is, when we take that oil, is we're mining the geologic history. Although this picture looks somewhat unfamiliar because uh, when we're looking for space, as we come down and uh, to Earth, literally, 
um, the splendor becomes much more in focus. So these are a couple pictures here. We have mountains that range over 13,000 feet. The top picture here is a panorama that looks down on what's known as Williams Lake, and then over the far right-hand side of this picture is the high point of New Mexico, which is uh, uh, Wheeler Peak. It's just a little over 13,000 feet, and what you're looking at when you look at this spectacular mountain range is something that uh, records a geologic event that began more than 70 million years ago and continues to today. Uh, up in the north eastern corner of the state, we have volcanoes, believe it or not, up by Raton. This is Capulin uh, cinder cone, and it has uh, a volcano that's less than 1,000 years old. Ghost Ranch produces spectacular pinks and oranges in their rocks. And uh, as we'll see, that those are recording something that occurred something like 250 or 270 million years ago. And then we have other volcanoes and necks and things like this. This is Cabazon. It's a small volcanic neck not too far from uh, uh, the Pueblo of Jemez, in which uh, we had events that are basically telling us that uh, our planet remains active and dynamic as we look forward. So to understand this fabulous landscape, um, I think we have to at least realize that uh, we got to read the rocks. And when we realize that we're going to read the rocks, we have to ask who else calls this, rock, this place home. So today, of course, we call this place home. But we've shared this home with many other creatures. The first kind of big creature, and I say big creature meaning that they dominated the scene uh, in New Mexico, was about 320, 330 million years ago, and these are trilobites. And over here on the right-hand side are a bunch of trilobites. This is drawings from a very early study on trilobites uh, that were collected actually in the Hamas Mountains about a place called Soda Dam, which we'll visit a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, so trilobites were perhaps the most ex successful creature in the history of the world. I know that sounds sort of bizarre for something that's extinct, but they dominated our ecosystem as an animal for almost 300 million years. Up here in the upper left is the Alamosaurus, which was discovered up by Farmington back in the uh, 1920s. And that's the largest dinosaur that ever walked North America. It's uh, something like 100 feet long and could weigh up to 80 tons. And uh, consumed, or at least we think it consumed, on the order of 500 pounds of vegetation a day. And then finally, maybe 11 or 12,000 years ago, uh, we were home to uh, something more familiar, at least as the way it looks, but uh, not quite. And that's the fearsome king of the hill, the saber-toothed tiger. And this was at the end or the, uh, of the great extent of uh, an ice age. And certainly not far from Los Alamos, uh, we find, uh, desert rema or we find uh, fossil remains of camels and uh, woolly mammoths and even occasionally a saber-toothed tiger. So we're really just the last in a long line that have made this place our home. So our landscape is dominated by humans today, you and I. And certainly this landscape says a lot about us. But just as in the past, when we had different creatures which adapted and exploited this land, we've adapted and exploited the land. So to best understand this, what I want to do is to talk about the geology that we have here. We're really going to kind of look at the last 1.8 billion years as expressed in northern New Mexico. We're a restless planet, or we live on a restless planet. Uh, endlessly, mountains are built only to be torn down by rain and sea and snow. Uh, sometimes the land beneath our feet was a shallow sea. Sometimes it's a parched desert. Other times, it may have been an ice sheet. What we need to do is be able to read those rocks. We need to understand our past. So in northern New Mexico, even though the planet is five, four and a half billion years old, our story really gives, begins about 1.8 billion years ago. On the far left-hand side of that picture above you is something which is called a, a meta gray wacky. Uh, sort of a bizarre name for a rock, but this is the, one of the oldest rocks in New Mexico, and it's found up in a little place close to uh, uh, Wheeler Peak, and it's about 1.8 billion years old. 
So if we look at the timeline, we've had created a planet, life began to evolve, but for more than half the age of the Earth, the little piece of land that we live on, the crust that we live on, did not exist. And it finally became in creation, this about 1.8 billion years ago. So our story starts with the building of the raft that we'll call northern New Mexico. So the land we come in existence really became because, as I said, the Earth is restless, but by two billion years it had cooled enough that the things that we recognize today like plate tectonics, so oceanic plates, volcanoes at the margins where two plates collide, um, the middle of oceans where we see plates moving apart, this kind of reworking of our surface gives rise to melting of the material of the Earth over and over, and this melting begins to what we call fractionate. It pulls out the light parts of the Earth, and they eventually congeal and form what we call a crust. And this crust is so light that it doesn't want to be pulled back down into the Earth to continue on the mixing process. If you had a big pull, a pot of soup, it's the froth at the top, and uh, that's what the raft that we are uh, live on today was created. Now you've got to see a map of uh, North America today and a different set of colors. Those colors all tell you about individual rafts or of continental crust and where they're created. And ours is called the Yavapai. And the Yavapai it kind of extends across New Mexico through Arizona. And it really did come in appearance about 1.8 billion years ago when we were sort of an island arc between an ancient plate tectonic boundary. Now we have a great paradox though. So we have these old rocks. And if I want to find these old rocks in New Mexico, I always got to go uphill. And so I showed you the gray wacky from up by Wheeler Peak. If you climb the high mountains outside of Santa Fe, you find rocks that are 1.7, maybe a little younger than that oldest rock. And these are a couple of these pictures. Here I am actually standing on Baldy, which everybody can see when they look out the window towards Santa Fe. If you're in Los Alamos driving home from work, it's the thing that is the spectacular vista that we see. And these old rocks are what are beneath our feet no matter where we are in northern New Mexico, but often buried beneath all the rest of the geologic history that's taken place. But if we go to the high country, sometimes we can look at these rocks and realize that they store in them this particular spectacular message about what happened in the past. We have a mystery, though, when we made these rocks, now we put them up high, we don't really have a picture of what happened in New Mexico between about 1.8 billion years ago and maybe 350 million years ago. We have a large gap. We call this in geology an unconformity. Something's missing. We don't really can't tell you what happened during that period of time. Maybe some really interesting stuff, but the modern theory is that much of that period we were underneath a deep ice sheet. We were in a snowball earth, and so we weren't preserving the rocks. But eventually that moved away. 500 million years ago, and we began to be able to have rocks that rose, eroded, got compressed, and made new rocks. So like a pages in a book, we can look at those and read what the life was like. So this map over here on the far left side is a map I'm going to refer to sometimes because it shows you once we made this wonderful raft, the Yavapai Craton is what we call it, it began to be active in plate tectonics and took a long journey. It went sometimes all the way to the poles, sometimes the equator. Sometimes it was a piece of a continental collision with another raft. Sometimes it overrode uh, an oceanic plate and we had large volcanoes. Uh, all these times through these journeys of billions of years, it left signatures like scars from your knee when you run or fall down that tell us what happened. Sometimes in New Mexico, we were large fields of dunes at an ocean boundary. And we'll look at some of those rocks. Sometimes we were a swamp. Sometimes we were the edge of a delta, not unlike what we see uh, for the Mississippi Delta in southern Louisiana, in which we 
We're eroding all this material from long ways away, but depositing and making new rocks. And so I'm going to step you through some of these things and look at these rocks. And in New Mexico, we're incredibly lucky to be able to do this because of the most amazing physiographic province, the Colorado Plateau. There's nowhere else in the world like this. But there's this piece of land that stretches in northern New Mexico, as you can see this kind of oval-shaped thing, through the four corner states, touches Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. And for whatever strange gift our planet has given us, it's given us a place that's been incredibly stable for over 300 million years. And that 300 million years has allowed us then to have very clear pictures of what happened in the past. Rocks were deposited, but they haven't been crushed and distorted. They have not all been eroded away. So we can have the large cliffs like you see of Ghost Ranch, or what's known as Tea, Pe uh, tea Kettle Rock, which is up uh, just north of Coyote in uh, the Hamas Mountains, uh, which were telling us stories about something distant past. Now, to give you a better picture of this, I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. I'm going to leave New Mexico just for a minute, go over to Arizona, and go to the Grand Canyon, because the Grand Canyon is the greatest library to read rocks, because the pages are all visible. So this is a notional cross-section to the Grand Canyon, as you're seeing over on the left-hand side, but rocks of different ages, so they're different colors in this, are stacked up. At the bottom is the oldest, and that mob purple color at the bottom is a thing that's 1.8 billion years. But as we walk up the different colors there, each one of them is telling us what's happening. Were we sand dunes? Were we a swamp? Did we make coal? And you could see this dramatically in the Grand Canyon. I just took this picture actually this year. This is looking on the south rim to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And over in this corner down, way over here, you can actually see the very bottom of the Grand Canyon. And those are 1.8 billion year rocks. You come up a little bit, and suddenly we go from the 1.8 to about 550 million years. So a huge gap is missing, but then everything progresses up and it's layers of rock. And I, all I need to do is walk through each one of those layers and look at what the fossils are, look at what the kind of minerals that are there to be able to tell what, uh, what was happening at that time. So now we're gonna go back to New Mexico and we're gonna, instead of looking at the single book, we're gonna to go to individual pages in the book and get some of those pictures. So if I went back oh, maybe 330 million years, there's New Mexico. We're right on the eastern edge of a shallow sea that split the North American continent. And that North American continent, as we look like this with a shallow sea, uh, existed sometimes very deep, sometimes very shallow for 100 million years. 100 million years is actually a long time, even for a geologic event. And we deposited sometimes sandstones. Uh, sometimes with shales, sometimes coals. And so up by Farmington, uh, we have these large reddish uh, sediments. These are called the Navajo sandstone. And these represent a period of time next to the ocean in which we were to take sands that blew down or came down from streams and went into the shallow sea. Uh, this is uh, a little bit further to the uh, east, and this is uh, close to Chama, where they have a more reddish, or sorry, yellowish sediment here. And this is from flood deposits that came along a great river that must have been very much uh, like the Mississippi today. So we can see these rocks and we can realize that we are standing on the shoulders of giants if those giants are the rocks that came in the past. One of my favorite geologic places in all of northern New Mexico is a place called Bisti. Bisti is a national wilderness area up very close to Farmington. In fact, it's only six miles from where that great dinosaur I showed you that roamed the Alamosaurus uh, 70 million years ago. And the rocks that I show here are about 70 million years, and I can look at these rocks and I can see some things. 
This thing in the first picture here is a large piece of petrified wood. It's about 30 feet long. And this piece of wood used to stand on the edge of a swamp. And this swamp looked very much like, as I said before, uh, like the Mississippi Delta. And so it had muds and it had uh, material that died that uh, eventually became things like coal and uh, were deposited and you can see small speckles of this. So I can imagine a land here that would be no different than if I was on the bayou. In the same place I can find uh, with this mud that sometimes the chemical reactions that would take place is that you would build uh, little what we call concretions which were much harder than the rest of the rock. And then as time has passed the rest of the rock is easily eroded away, leaving this cap. We call this a hoodoo, giving the feeling that you have some kind of, uh, something that you would only see in a Star Wars kind of movie, uh, but a, a foreign landscape. But that landscape is telling us what we live today as a desert was once a great swamp that not only was home to dinosaurs, but some of the largest shallow water predators that the Earth has ever known. This is a great picture from uh, Beastie, which shows a rows and rows of these concretions. And when you look at it, you almost believe that there must have been some magical hand of a giant at some time, which put these things together like some kind of earthy uh, Easter eggs. In fact, they're uh, just concretions and everything else is eroded away. This is called Turtleback Avenue, even though they're not actually uh, turtle shells. And uh, what you're looking at is basically two football fields of large concretions. Again, reminding you that what we have today is a product of something that was very, very different in the past. So we have this thick layer of these sediments that we're now able to go explore. After about 70 million years ago, things changed dramatically on Earth. Of course, at 66 million years, we had a large meteorite strike the Earth and caused uh, what we call an extinction-level event. It didn't change the geology, but it suddenly changed, at least from a geologic time scale, uh, the animals and things that were present. It also marked the beginning of some changes that we see from the Colorado Plateau. And one of these changes is that starting around 50 million years ago, we began to have little volcanic cinders occur all around. What we think happened is this Colorado Plateau being very stable over a dynamic earth, kind of is like a blanket over a hot water bottle. If you put that blanket there, it's going to insulate it, and if it insulates it, it just gets hot, and the way it releases that heat is to have little burps of volcanic activity. The most famous of these in all the Colorado Plateau is Ship Rock, which is up um, near Farmington. And this is this uh, volcanic neck. So this used to be a small volcano that just came up. It used to be buried. Um, and what we've seen now is the rocks, other than volcanic rocks, have been eroded away. And what we're looking at is the neck and then the long feeders that came around from that neck that broke the rock in the past. This is another much smaller one, this is Cabazon. So if you look down towards Hamas, this is a picture of Cabazon. We actually have roughly 70 of these small volcanic centers. So now we're going from talking about swamps to talking about small volcanoes. But the biggest recent change of all northern New Mexico is the opening of the Rio Grande Rift. So we had a large plate that was put together of these small rafts that collided, and they behaved in what we call, as a geologist, the North American plate for plate tectonics. But around 30 million years ago, that plate began to break apart in New Mexico. One side, that contains the Taos and Mount Wheeler Peak, began to pull away from the other side, Farmington, Shiprock. 
the exact reason why this happens is a great uh, source of debate, but the signature of this slow pulling apart is a spectacular and are certainly more responsible for the landscape we see and we marvel at than any other geologic event. So we can imagine as we take this and pull it apart, it's almost like toffee. As we pull it, the toffee stays more or less the thickness that it started with where my fingers are, but as we pull the toffee inside, stretches. As it stretches, it allows the deeper part of the earth, which is hotter, to rise, and we get volcanic centers, and huge amounts of new volcanic material come to the surface. This is, again, our thousand-foot view of northern New Mexico, and I'm focusing now. This is the Rio Grande River. This is where Taos is today. This is the border with Colorado, so this is a little volcanic dome, which is called San Antonio, and we're looking up towards Alamosa, uh, these are the spine of the Rockies that come back down. What we're going to see is this whole region from here to here is that stretched out toffee. And all the rock that we see on the surface there now has come up from the deep, and these are basaltic or volcanic flows. So that tear line between the two sides is where the Rio Grande River flows today. So it's we call the Rio Grande Rift. And one of our most famous scenic attractions is the bridge over the Rio Grande Gorge. So what you're actually looking at is a bridge over this pulling apart of our planet. This looks down from north to east. And all the rock you see on the right-hand side, all the rock you see on the left-hand side is volcanic basalt, which has come up as we've pulled this rift apart. This is looking a little bit further north if I walked along the Rio Grande Rift. And again, this is all volcanic material. And occasionally we get something off to the sides of where the rift it is where we get even more domes that didn't really erupt, but they're all volcanic material. This is Ute Mountain. It's one of my favorite places in New Mexico. It's an area which is a very, very seldom uh, visited, but it's about a 9,800 foot peak. And it's home to spectacular elk, curds, um, all taking advantage of the fact that we have a desolate terrain, partially because of our climate, but also because we've made a new place in which we have vast fields of basalt. This is the same Rio Grande Rift, but much closer to our home in Los Alamos. This is actually from the Rio Grande, or from the White Rock Overlook, looking down to that river, as I said, that is a ribbon of life that comes through New Mexico. And uh, we're looking down at the basalts, both on our side and on the far side, which is called uh, the Caja, Rio de Caja of volcanic flows. Each one of these is a small little cone of a basalt, and those basalt flows are around two million years. Now, the basalt was part of our culture. So basalt, when it uh, is exposed in long times to sun, um, often forms a varnish. And that varnish is a perfect palette for petroglyphs. So these are some of the petroglyphs, the most famous ones. They're just uh, below the uh, uh, Pajarito Acres. And uh, you can see uh, what's known as the Three Snake Petroglyph, and then uh, what is thought to be an antelope and other creatures that are here. They're recording on this in our geology as a palette to record their history. And again, it's the symbiote relationship between the geology and supporting the humanity that lived here. But the crown jewel of all geology in northern New Mexico is the Rio Grande Rift. It's, I'm sorry, it's the Jemez Caldera. And so if you were able to look where I am, at least today, I don't know where you are, since this is all virtual, I'm sitting right here. And over here, just to the west of me, to the left in this figure, is the world's first identified supervolcano. Um, started having a series of volcanoes here around 12 million years ago. The volcanoes had fits and starts, and they had little eruptions, and they built things uh, that look sort of like you, what you would expect for volcanoes. 
but culminating in two super eruptions about 1.4 and 1.2 million years ago, which ejected material, so much material in a volcano that the inside of that volcano collapsed in on itself, producing the, what we call the Valle Grande today, which is actually just this area here, but other areas which collapsed down and continue to have activity up to around 40,000 years ago. When this was first identified as being a volcanic event, uh, people were able to find ash from uh, this series of eruption that were as far away as Kansas, um, and that's after a long period of time, too, when you think about that, and later identified water that had washed down the Rio Grande and were deposited in the Big Bend National Park in Texas. So a truly spectacular series of eruptions, which probably occurred over years at most to produce the spectacular landscape. And those of you who go uh, on Highway 4, um, you pass the Via Grande, which is one of these collapsed craters. This is one of my favorite pictures looking on this. This is, in the background here, is part of the caldera itself. It's a dome. It's called a Redondo uh, and Redondito is this little one here, which aren't actually volcanic vents, but uplifts were lava that was still uh, present even after these super explosions wanted to push towards the surface. This whole area after the collapse, though, filled with water and made one of uh, a very, very large lake. Most of you are familiar with a volcanic collapse lake uh, called Crater Lake in Oregon. Uh, this would be about 150 times as large as uh, Crater Lake for the entire lake that was filled during this time. This is taken from an aerial photograph just to show you the Valle Caldera. So it's about 13 miles across. And if you look to, across as we come here, uh, our ski area is about over in here. And you can see the Valle Grande, but you see a whole series all the way around here in the 13 miles. So you can imagine this whole area was involved in a volcanic eruption in which material came out and then everything else collapsed back in on itself. Uh, as it collapsed back in on itself, as I'll show you in a moment, there was still some magma and it pushed up and we have all these what we call resurgent domes that have came and then some very small volcanic eruptions that occur over this. But we had a very large lake uh, that sat here filling this and again, this was about a million years ago that we began to really uh, build a large lake there. This is how a geologist sees it. We like colors, you know, crayons, so we can actually paint a picture of what this looks like. Uh, the picture I just showed you was looking from up here towards this direction. So the, in our map, we're looking. The white is where the lake deposits are today, and the, each one of these yellows is where a dome is pushed up, with the exception of this color here, which is the largest in the central dome, which is uh, the Redondo Dome. So you can see this 13-kilometer lake or uh, radius uh, across here, which was a lake with a center cone. It eventually broke through the edge and drained out this area here, which of course goes down to Hamas Springs. So if we look at this magnificent geologic event, we can begin to construct what it must have looked like. So this is an evolution. So if we go back all the way to 12 million years, not just 4 million years, we had a number of smaller volcanoes in our area. But for whatever reason, they finally got together and they communicated to a large magma body and we had a super eruption. Uh, today we think that there's been three major super eruptions in what's North America. There's the Hamas, there is Mammoth Lakes in California, and there's Yellowstone. And I'll compare those in a moment. After that came, then the same magma body began to came up and build domes and push up, and the lake eventually drained out on one side. Uh, the last time we had, a, again, a, an eruption here was on the order of 40,000 years ago, uh, but it was a very, very minor eruption. We can't say we'll never have another eruption from here, but we're definitely looking at an active but dying spectacular volcanic system. This is an example of some of the material that came out. This is from, uh, 
national park that's down by Cochiti. Uh, this is Tent Rocks. And so you're looking at some of the ash. This ash flew up in a huge cloud. It went up to at least 13 kilometers elevation and rained out as the wind moved it to the east in particular and cooled and built this thick st stacks of sediments. Mostly it's very soft material, but sometimes there's harder pieces and these harder pieces sit at the top of this and as rain and frost uh, come, it erodes away the soft stuff except for that right below the top of uh, something that's hard. And again, these are a different kind of hoodoo giving you again a landscape that is reminiscent of something that you would see in a Hobbit movie rather than uh, what you see in, uh, certainly if you're from Kansas. Uh, we can go measure the total amount of material that came out of this and get some size idea of the size of those eruptions. And so this is what we do as we compare it here. And so when we look at the Via Caldera, if you just look at the size of the eruptions, most of you are most familiar with Mount St. Helens, which was back in 1980. So when Mount St. Helens came and blew off the top of a volcano that people were quite familiar with, uh, it produced ash that stopped all airline traffic for almost two weeks in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Ash fell on uh, the windows of cars overnight as far away as Minneapolis, uh, um, Minnesota. But we could fit almost uh, uh, 900 of those eruptions into what happened in the Valles Caldera. Now, it's a little scary. We're actually smaller than what happened at Yellowstone, uh, but it's still an indication of how truly amazing, truly uh, powerful this eruption was. And so today, we can look at uh, the landscape that we have here along the former lake beds, they serve perfect grazing grounds for elk. And so you're looking at some of the largest herds of elk in uh, northern New Mexico, Ron the Valle Caldera, and you can see the male And this. Uh, soon we'll see um, these herds return, and we'll also see all the young elk, um, the young calves, which are being born as we uh, talk here today. Um, there's a number of streams that pass through uh, the different flat areas here. Some of, I think of the fly fishing that we have in northern New Mexico is mainly due to these streams. Where the stream broke through, uh, it uh, carved a deep canyon and gave us landforms like things like Battleship Rock. And so Battleship Rock is an interesting, we can see a geologic material here which was ejected, but this material below it is even more interesting. It was also ejected, but that's obsidian. And so that gives us a hard ridge that came out. As the river broke through and came down, it came across a region which were hot springs, or at least warm springs, and we built like Soda Dam, where I talked about Soda Dam before. And this is a picture of uh, Soda Dam uh, recently when the water was freezing, so you get these spectacular, instead of stalactites, icicles that came across. We still have as even more recent examples of geology operating on us before we ever arrived. North America started to experience a number of very large ice sheet events starting about a million years ago. So just about the time that we had these major eruptions, we began to have a number of ice sheets which crept across the country. And these ice sheets were spectacular. So you've seen the glaciers of Greenland or Antarctica. Well, we had similar size ice sheets come across, and if we go to a place like Maine today, the ice that crept across there was more than a kilometer and a half thick. This cooled the planet, or cooled North America in particular, significantly. We never had one of these ice sheets in New Mexico, but the coolness meant that we had many, many montane or high elevation glaciers. And so we could see where all the glaciers that were in New Mexico were present, and that's these black areas where we can find evidence of a glacier. Uh, the hatched area here shows you where we, we would call an alpine environment and where maybe grew some large lakes. With this cool environment and higher precipitation, we got the animals that kind of sit in this class that we call the, uh, the furries, 
So we had woolly mammoths, and this is also where the saber-toothed tigers. But this glaciers did carve our landscape, and we can see that today. So this is a picture of what's classically done to a high landscape when you get a montane glacier. It carves it out in what we call a cirque. So this is a picture of, here's Wheeler Peak again, our, what we started the talk with, our highest elevation. And then we see a deep valley. This deep valley has a little lake in it, which is called Williams Lake. And this is over on this side is the Taos Ski Hill. And this large area here was scooped out like a spoon as the ice carved this out. And so what we're looking at today, when I stand here and come to the high point, is 1.8 billion year old rocks looking at nature's sculpture that is still evolving only a few thousand years ago. So this snapshot tour tells you that where we're living today is something that's dynamic and changing. The culture that we have in northern New Mexico is one which prizes water. So the Rio Grande River is very, very important, and much of our civilization is right along that Rio Grande River. But that Rio Grande River is there because we have an active geologic process taking today, which is taking this ancient raft that was first put together 1.8 billion years ago, and today is finally breaking apart. So I leave you with a picture. This is from uh, Los Alamos uh, employees' photograph of a lightning strike in the Valle Caldera. And the reason I do it is not only is it a spectacular picture, but it reminds you that the environment that we live in is bigger than we are. What we're seeing is ever-changing, but it also is like a book. It's built on all the chapters that have come in the past. So what I'd like to see is, you know, as you go and you look at the world and you look at northern New Mexico and you enjoy this, appreciate that that we are the latecomers to this and many times we've been, uh, had creatures which came before us, which were the masters of the terrain, but in fact the earth was in charge. So thank you very much, and I look forward to if there's any questions. Okay, I see some questions coming up here. And uh, I don't know all the questions, but I'll tell you. The first one is, the, the sea that divides North American continent apart from the Great Continental Divide. What was the name of that? Uh, so there's many different names for the inland sea. And one of the hard things is, this is a hard thing is it, for geoscientists. We take a snapshot in time, and so we have a big sea that deposits the rocks. If you go to the Sandia Mountains and you look at the Sandia Mountains, you can see layers, and those layers are basically limestones that were parts of reefs, just like outside of Hawaii, for an in, but except of an inland sea 300 million years ago. And uh, so that inland sea uh, lasted for millions of years, occasionally filled in with for millions of years, and then came back for millions of years. And so I would say, uh, when we look at that and we ask for the specific names of it, I think it's to think about uh, that what we're looking at is snapshots in time which don't do justice to the ever-moving uh, movie that would be a much better picture of how, how dynamic our planet truly is. There was a question here, so where were the turtleback rocks located? That's in Bisti. Now, Visti is, like I said, one of my favorite places to go. You don't want to go there in the middle of summer, though. But uh, if you go there in the fall or winter, um, it's uh, just south, maybe 20 miles south of Farmington. And it's a wilderness area that has not a single trail in it. You just start walking. And uh, it's not a huge area, but you walk out there, and you are going to explore. You're going to find spectacular... Uh, petrified wood, and you'll find the turtleback rocks. But I can't draw you a map for it because it just happens to be one of those great experiences when you stumble upon something that's so cool 
uh, that you know that you were meant to see it. Question is, why is tough, meaning volcanic tuff so, so soft? And so uh, you can again think about when you have this volcanic eruption, um, the, the lava and so on in it, if it's not very explosive, you end up having a very liquid lava and you end up with basalt. So what we're seeing for the basalts along the Rio Grande Rift, or if you're watching the news today for the volcanic eruption in Iceland, those are all basalts. Everything that's in Hawaii is basalt. But if we tend to add a little too much water to that magma, a little too much quartz, then it gets sort of, instead of runny, it becomes more constipated. And it builds up pressures, and when it explodes, it tends to be ashy. And those ashes then come out, and they're very hot. But depending on how far they travel, they cool, and by the time they hit the ground, their ability to weld into something strong uh, is very much diminished. Okay, I see a question here. Is there an opportunity for fossil hunting and paleontology? Absolutely. If you go to Soda Dam, uh, on either side of Soda Dam, but in typically the, the, uh, something like the, uh, uh, the western side, um, there are limestone deposits there that are filled with small fossils. If you go to Gilman Tunnels, just as you come out of Gilman Tunnel, uh, there's limestones present that are filled with fossils. Uh, anybody can find a fossil at just out there. I won't say that anybody because then the first thing is people are going to find them, but uh, outside a Gilman Tunnel. And they're great places, and they're, they're very, very kid-friendly in terms of being able to find these uh, kinds of fossils. When is welded tuff formed? So if you're in Los Alamos and you come to work at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, we chose, uh, one of the reasons the laboratory was chosen to build there is that it had a lot of mesas with deep canyons. And so that's uh, basically uh, because the welded tuff still isn't that strong, but you see these welded tuff and these mesas uh, are the remnants of a large blanket. If you ask me how much of the tuff eroded away, more than two-thirds of the tuff is gone. So we still think of us being on high mesa, but most of the material has been eroded away. So it is much stronger because it was hotter when it welded together, but it's still not strong material compared to, for example, the hard 1.8 billion year old granites that are atop of Mount Baldy. So I think I exhausted all your questions. And uh, I hope you enjoy just, again, uh, the fact that we have such a spectacular backyard. And I hope that when we think about this, we realize that when we see something spectacular, it actually is not just today and now. It's telling you a story that's a geologic story. And in that geologic story, it's telling you something about uh, everything that we are today. We evolved on this planet and we build culture in this particular area and the geology has a much stronger fingerprint on us than we often appreciate. So understanding our agriculture, understanding why we choose to do things from a perspective of a civilization are very much uh, driven by what nature has given us. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'll, I'll, uh, we're going to take a five-minute break, and uh, we'll be back. And so I know that the next presentation will be introduced, but it'll be about the monsoon. And everybody that's in the audience right now should be hoping for a really good monsoon this year. So when the next speaker tells you that it's going to be not as good as you'd like, then remember his name and blame him. Thank you. <laughs>